deeper and faster. Use normal precautions for brazing the tubing between the condensing unit and the evaporator for the suction and liquid lines. When you connect the suction line to the evaporator, you need to remove the temperature sensor on the suction line before brazing, since the heat could damage the sensor. First, remove the insulation, then the sensor from the suction line. After you complete the brazing and the suction line has cooled, reinsert the sensor into the provided copper tube sleeve. The insulation provided must be wrapped around the sensor and sleeve for proper sensing. You also need to protect the electric expansion valve from excessive brazing heat when you connect the liquid line to the evaporator. Please use a heat dam or wrap the valve with wet rags before and during brazing. Wiring the beacon system is safer, easier, and less expensive than conventional systems because of its 24-volt control circuit. In most locations, a contractor can do the 24-volt control circuit wiring without the expense of hiring an electrician. Remember, 24-volt wiring must be separated from any line voltage wiring. The condensing unit control panel contains the outdoor fan relay, compressor contactor, and the 24-volt control transformer, along with an appropriately marked terminal block for wiring connections to the master beacon board. Mounting the controls directly on the evaporators eliminates the need to power the evaporator fan motors and heaters from the condensing unit. Separate power sources can be used for convenience and economy. Five low voltage leads are needed to connect the condensing unit to the master beacon board. A minimum of 18 gauge solid wire must be used for up to 500 feet runs. Use heavier gauge wire for longer runs. The multi-in and multi-out terminals on the beacon board are not used for wiring a single evaporator system. Of course, all wiring must comply with national and local codes. There are several additional points you need to consider when you're installing the beacon as part of multiple or master-slave evaporator systems. Any evaporator may be designated as master in the field. Only the master controller's room temperature sensor should remain connected. The room temperature sensor of each slave controller must be disconnected. Also, wiring from the condensing unit must connect to the master controller. Wiring to slave controllers should be done in the following steps. Connect four wires from the master controller to the first slave. This connection consists of two wires for 24 volt power connections and two wires from multi-out connections of the master to multi-in terminals of the first slave. Then connect wires from the first slave controller to the second slave. Connect two wires for 24 volt power connections and two wires from multi-out connections on the first slave to multi-in terminals on the second slave. Repeat the process until all slave controllers have been wired. Finally, connect two wires from the last slave controller multi-out terminals back to the master controller multi-in terminals. These multi-out to multi-in connections are to be in a series or daisy chain arrangement. With this setup, the master board will control the system's room temperature, defrost initiation, defrost fail-safe settings, and defrost termination. The onboard alarm is a dry set of normally closed contacts, which close on an alarm condition. The type of alarm and its wiring are specified by the customer. The alarm circuit does not indicate what caused the alarm. Fault codes are communicated through red LED blinks on the beacon boards. Now let's look at beacon system settings. Evaporator controls are set by placing jumpers to desired positions on the beacon boards which are mounted on the front of the evaporators. There are only two types of beacon boards, one for air defrost systems and one for electric defrost systems. Factory defaults on these boards are set to satisfy the majority of system installations. Electric defrost boards are factory set for minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit room temperature. The air defrost boards are set for plus 35 degrees room temperature. Check the manual for a description of other factory default settings. These settings can be changed in the field to reflect desired room temperature selections from plus 60 degrees Fahrenheit to minus 25 degrees using two different methods. The first method uses a fixed resistor. 
Extra color-coded resistors of varying values are shipped in a packet with the unit. Determine the correct resistor value for the desired room temperature from Table 1 in the INO manual. Remove the factory installed resistor from across the 200K terminals and replace with the selected fixed resistor. The second method employs the room thermostat function on the board. Remove the factory installed fixed resistor from across the 200K terminals. Then connect a digital ohm meter across the terminals marked 200K and X. Use a screwdriver to turn the blue pot until the meter reading matches the appropriate value for the desired room temperature, according to Table 1 in the INO manual. Finally, remove the meter and install the red jumper supplied in the resistor packet across the X terminals. Defrost cycles are time initiated and temperature terminated unless the failsafe time is reached. This works the same way as a conventional system. Air and electric defrost boards have different defaults. The cycles can be spaced evenly throughout the day in what's called the elapsed mode. Or they can be based on compressor runtime, called the run mode, by placing the jumper in the desired position. Use the Beacon INO manual to set the desired number of defrost times per day. You can select the superheat setting that you want the expansion valve to maintain for each evaporator by placing the jumper for 6, 8, or 12 degrees Fahrenheit. During operation, the electric expansion valve may be adjusted every two minutes if necessary to maintain the setting, and the beacon LED will blink the actual evaporator's superheat. Other settings on the board indicate the application mode as either medium for air defrost or low for electric defrost. This is set at the factory. The test or normal must always be in the norm mode. Don't change this selection. The type two or type one setting is not used. Reset time or normal allows you to reset all internal timers back to zero with a momentary connection. Otherwise, the timer in the elapsed mode starts at power on and maintains even intervals from that point on. Force defrost, or normal, lets you force an extra defrost for servicing. The normal defrost cycle is not affected by momentarily making this connection. When charging refrigerant, you should follow leak testing procedures according to normal practices. The beacon uses a limited floating head and does not require an extra winter refrigerant charge to flood the condenser. When the outdoor ambient temperature is above 75 degrees Fahrenheit, charge the unit until the sight glass clears. Charging when the ambient is below 75 degrees is a different matter. For best results, reduce airflow through the condenser until you can maintain the equivalent of 105 degrees Fahrenheit condensing temperature. Then charge the system to clear the sight glass. The low pressure switch located in the condensing unit will be factory preset at zero PSIG cutout. Appropriate head pressure controls and pressure fan cycling should be used for outdoor ambient temperatures below minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. The settings of the time delay relay across the low pressure switch must be checked before startup. The time delay relay should be set at two minutes and the low pressure switch should be set at zero PSIG. After you check all wiring connections to be sure they are correct and tight, Verify the beacon jumper settings, test, and charge the unit. Some systems may require you to energize the crankcase heaters for 24 hours prior to startup. The beacon should be de-energized for this period by disconnecting the 24-volt leads to the condensing unit terminal block. To start the system, reattach these 24-volt leads. Beacon begins the initial startup sequence by holding off the compressor, the electric expansion valve, and the fan motors for four minutes. The system may cycle off due to low superheat at initial startup. Let the system run as the valve is adjusting itself. It may take a few cycles over a period of 20 to 30 minutes to attain the superheat and begin normal operation. A pump down cycle will begin when room temperature is reached and the compressor has run for at least four minutes. The EEV will close with its last position held in memory. The evaporator fan motors will continue to run. Pump down time will vary according to the outdoor ambient. 
If the compressor discharge temperature reaches 225 degrees Fahrenheit for four minutes, the superheat setting will be temporarily lowered to prevent the discharge temperature from rising. If discharge temperature reaches 275 degrees for four minutes, an alarm condition is triggered and an error code will indicate a high discharge temperature fault. The LED will blink this code as a warning to the operator while the system continues to run. Beacon units are shipped with pressure fan cycling on single condenser fan units. On multiple fan condensing units, one fan is cycled on condensing pressure and the others on ambient temperature. Earlier beacon versions cycle the outdoor condenser fans when the outdoor ambient is below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The system's superheat is too high and the expansion valve is almost fully open. The position of the EEV can be checked by connecting a voltmeter across the EXV test pins on the beacon board while the unit is running. The reading should indicate zero volts DC for a closed signal from the board up to a maximum of five volts DC for fully open signal from the board. At the end of the defrost cycle, the system goes through a drain down period for one minute after the heaters are turned off. Then the EEV opens to its last position and the compressor comes on for a refreeze period of one minute after drain down. The evaporator fan motors are turned on at the end of the refreeze period. The air defrost cycle is similar to the electric defrost without the heaters. You should consider room temperature when adjusting the termination temperature and fail-safe time. To select the appropriate setting, refer to the installation and operations manual. The beacon manual contains service diagnostic charts, which list problems with possible causes and corrective actions. The beacon board itself may not be functioning properly if any of the following indicators are present. The indicator status light is not illuminated. The indicator status light doesn't flash. The indicator status light flashes erratically. Or if, at initial power on, the EEV doesn't close. To test the board, first, set the test jumper to the test position. The beacon board will cycle through each output for 10 seconds. The outputs are for the fan motors, electric heaters, the EEV, alarm contacts, and the compressor. An error will show for bad sensors or other problems. At the end of the test, return the jumper to the normal position. Our Beacon Replacement Parts Program was developed to ensure the availability of replacement parts when local sources cannot deliver quickly. After you call the 800 number, the requested part will be in your hands by the next day. Even after hours or on weekends, the Replacement Parts Program will put you in touch with UPS for rapid shipment 365 days a year. When you call, please be ready to provide the replacement part number and unit serial numbers. All replaced Beacon parts must be returned so we can evaluate them for future product improvements. Remember, several special considerations are necessary when installing a beacon system. When brazing the liquid line tubing connection, prevent excessive heat from damaging the electric expansion valve by wrapping it with wet rags or using a heat dam. Remove the sensor mounted on the suction line before brazing the suction line tubing connection. Then reinsert it into its sleeve and insulate it after the line has cooled. All 24 volt wiring must be separated from the line voltage wiring. Use a minimum of 18 gauge thermostat wiring to connect the condensing unit to the evaporator. On multiple evaporator systems, wiring from the condensing unit must go to the master beacon control board. Room sensor wires must be removed from slave beacon boards and multi-in to multi-out wiring connections must be done in a daisy chain arrangement the beacon system has a limited floating head which requires less refrigerant charge and operates at lower head pressures than conventional systems. System controls are set with the use of jumpers on the beacon boards. The room temperature settings must be changed if the desired value is different from the factory default. The compressor is locked out for four minutes on initial power up and then locked on for four minutes. The beacon board will transmit blinks to advise operational modes, superheat data, and fault conditions. And beacon replacement parts are available through a special quick shipment program. 
The unique and innovative Beacon system offers benefits at every level of distribution and use. From Heatcraft, the name behind the names you trust.